Now then, where were we? Hello, Internet. My name is Quinn, and this is Blondie Hacks. Working on the Pennsylvania A3 switcher locomotive this week, and we're going to make the main rods. These are what transmit the power from the pistons into the main drivers on the locomotive. Should be pretty cool. Let's go. The main rods have a lot in common with the side rods, so I'm skipping over some details, assuming you've already watched that video, the previous one in this series. So I'm starting with 4140 once again, and it has been normalized. One difference here is that I'm slimming it down quite a bit on the bandsaw, much more than I did with the side rods. I spent a lot of time on those side rods, machining away material that didn't need to be there all along. So starting with something much closer to dimension. Another nice key difference with the main rods is that the ends of them are actually square. This is per the prototype. And so that actually gives us a nice easy shape to start with and gives us a convenient reference for all the features on the part. So after the usual cleaning up of edges and bringing to dimension and thinning down of the stock, similar to what I did on the side rods, I also machined one end to give me a finished end and thus a reference also for all the other features on the parts. So the left end of these blanks is actually the finished main rod now. On then to the next set of features, which are going to be the holes, similar to the side rods. I'll line up the end with the Heimer. On the x-axis, I found a center line using a different edge finder for no reason because I felt like it shut up, that's why. Now I can center drill, pilot drill, and ream the big end of the rod. This is where the main bearing goes that rides on the crank pin on the rear driver. The other end is the small end that is driven by the crosshead off of the piston rod. Speaking of which, down at that end, I'm going to drill a little reference hole all the way through for the small end, but I'm not going to drill it out yet. This is sort of like an infinitely deep punch mark, if you will. We have a lot more material to remove, but I want to mark this position now while I have a good reference from the big end, so that's an accurately positioned hole. Then I'm actually going to drill another hole outboard of that, and this is going to be for fixturing. So the rod actually ends just past where that tiny hole was drilled. And this is all extra material beyond that that I'm just going to be used for fixturing. And now with the fixture block that you may recognize from the side rods, I've set it up aligned with the x-axis on my mill, and I'm going to be using it to hold the rods for a bunch of these operations. I have modified it a little bit from the side rods. I've tapped new mounting holes right at the top of the block, which will allow me to work these rods with a small end mill in a single operation. You may recall on the side rods, I foolishly mounted the rods down in the middle of the fixture block and thus I couldn't reach it with a rigid end mill. So I had to do it in a couple of different passes with different sized end mills. It was a lot of extra fooling around. So I learned from that experience. One thing that worked well though on the side rods was this act of plunging the end radius for the thinned out feature area. And plunging allows me to get in right to the accurate position of that fillet that I want and then get it to full depth and then side mill the rest of the feature down to that depth. Getting a side milled fillet to land in exactly the right place is actually kind of tricky to do, but I found that sneaking up on it with a bunch of little plunge cuts really works, and then you can just side mill up to meet where your plunge cuts ended. So there's one side milled. That's looking good. Now, I actually made a mistake here. I was supposed to leave an extra bit of material along the bottom for support when I flipped the piece around. You might remember that from the side rods. I forgot to do that, so I'm going to call an audible here. In the midst of this, realizing my mistake, I thought of another way to do this, so I'm going to commit to that instead. I'm going to put the other blank from the other rod onto the fixture block and bring it to the same point. I mill it down on one side. Now I've got both rods with one side milled. Then I take the end mill that I just used and come in and actually mill out a chunk of my fixture block. I create a recess, the depth of which is the difference between the starting blank thickness of the rod and the final web thickness of the rod on one side. And then on X and Z, it's a little bit larger than the rod end. And what that will allow me to do is recess the rod with the cut that we've just made on the inside up against the fixture block. And so it will remain supported the same way as it would have the way the side rods were done, leaving a little thick strip at the bottom. But this way, I can not have to leave that extra strip and just bolt the piece up flipped around like so. And I got away with doing this because at this point I was done with the fixture block the way it was, so I can modify it now for the next series of operations. Here you can see how the recessed area of the rod is now sitting up against the fixture, and the thicker rod end is recessed up against that area that we just cut. I gotta say, that worked really well. I was able to very quickly do the remaining cut on the other side of both rods, 
and those recesses are going to come in handy a few more times. If I'd thought of this when I did the side rods, I would have done it this way because this was much, much quicker and easier than the way I did the side rods. Just goes to show that Kozo has a ton of really good suggestions for operations in the books, but I don't always agree with them, and sometimes I do find what I think is an easier way. Now, next up, I'm going to lay out the tapers on these. So I've blued up the parts. I'm going to take them over to the surface plate because these rods need to be tapered down to a pinch point, and then they have a little teardrop shape at the small end. To achieve that, I'm going to lay out the intersection points between the taper and the teardrop area here on the surface plate with the height gauge. I'm using that tiny pilot hole that's for the small end of the rod as my reference, accounting for the radius of the pin, of course. And this allows me to translate up to where the pinch point is, where the two features meet with a little bit of math, and I can mark two little intersection points. The other dimension is easily measured from taking the numbers off the drawing because, of course, at this point, the top and bottom of the rod are valid reference surfaces. They are the exact height of the big end of the rod. Those little cross marks there are the key features on the shape of the rod. That's the point where the teardrop and the small end of the taper meet. So from there, I just connect the dots. I connect the big end of the rod with those cross marks, which will give me the taper that I need to cut. Now for the teardrop shape, this is a little bit trickier, but bear in mind these layout lines are just guidelines. They're not final arbiters of what I'm going to be cutting, but I can put a divider in that reference hole for the small end and trace out the outline of the teardrop shape, the radius that it needs, and then I can connect the tangent of that curve to those cross marks to create the teardrop connection to the small end of the taper. Now these layout lines are a little bit rough, but you do see what I'm going for here. The final cuts are going to be determined by the fixture and the DRO. So these layout lines are just sanity checks to make sure I'm doing everything correct. I'm not going to be cutting straight to these lines, so they don't have to be perfect. Back over to the fixture block now, oriented upwards. And again, using those recesses allows me to bolt the rods firmly down against the fixture block. Another key feature here that's different from the side rods is that the top edge of the fixture block is now a reference surface. So I can use a 1, 2, 3 block to align that rod with the edge of the fixture block, which will make this fixture repeatable for four cuts that we need to make. Now I can come in with my pointer, center that up on the spindle, and I can rotate the entire fixture block on the mill table to get the angle correct. Now this angle is just aesthetic, so it doesn't have to be exactly perfect to some specific angle, but I want all four cuts on the two sides of the two rods to be the same. So I'm doing my best to line it up such that when I translate on X, the pointer follows my layout line exactly end to end. Once I've got that, now I know that I can make a straight cut on X and it's going to create the taper that I want, or at least very close to the taper that's indicated by that layout line. Then more importantly, I can make all four cuts in this repeatable fixture and they're going to come out identical and symmetrical. To make the cut then, I chose a relatively small diameter end mill to minimize the radius effects at the taper end here. And I push in a little bit and make a series of passes. For the depth of this first cut at the small end, I went until I reached the layout line. Again, that layout line may not be perfect, but it's going to be close enough, and then more importantly, all four cuts that I'm going to be doing will be the same. Of course, I'm cutting into my fixture block as I do that, but that's fine. It's a sacrificial block. So with one taper done now, now I can flip this piece over and do the same cut on the other side. Once again, using one, two, three blocks to align the rod ends with the top of the fixture block, which makes this cut repeatable. I've also got an end stop, you'll notice, on the rod end that is finished, so that's a valid reference. So the piece is repeating now on both X and Y. So all I have to do is mill to the same depth at the small end of the taper on Y, and the same far X value on the DRO, and the taper should come out exactly the same on both sides. And in fact, it landed right on my layout line on the other side. So that is worthy of a metric horns of victory. Then I can bring in the other rod blank and do the same two cuts with it. Once again, using my end stop to repeat on X with the finished rod end and using one, two, three blocks to reference the top of the fixture block on the rod ends for repeatability on both axes of this cut. I gotta say this worked really well, better than I could have hoped. I'm very, very pleased with how symmetrical and identical the two rods came out. They don't have to be perfectly identical because you can only see one at a time. They're on opposite sides of the locomotive, but the symmetry of them is fairly important as well, and I think I achieved that.
Now I can finally make the small end holes. So I'm lining up my pointer on the reference hole that we created, the little infinite punch mark. And I can drill and ream that to final dimension. Hopefully you see now why this reference was done as a tiny pilot hole rather than a punch mark, because we had to thin down the rods with that side milling, so any punch mark that we made would have disappeared by now. I no longer need that little excess material at the end that was used for fixturing, so I'll lop that off over on the bandsaw. Then it's over to the rotary table to round the ends. I'm going to use my sacrificial rotary table fixture plate that I made in a recent video. This was a bit of an experimental idea, but I gotta say, so far it's working out really well. I'm going to line up the pieces with a pin in the spindle to get me centered on the mill spindle. The rotary table has already been centered on the mill spindle, so now the component has to be centered on the rotary table, which I again do with the spindle. And then I clamp it down, and now we can rotate this guy around and make our cuts. I haven't aligned the piece on any kind of X or Y axis, both because that's a little difficult because it's tapered, but also because it just isn't necessary. The end points of this cut are just being done by eye anyway. I'm just stopping well conservative of where my layout lines are. Because of that sharp inside corner that we need between the taper and the teardrop, that's going to have to be done with filing at the end in any case. So I plunge cut away the bulk of the material, and then I did a finishing cut all the way around to get a nice smooth radius all the way around. Once again, this fixture plate has worked out great, so I recommend it if you're thinking about doing something similar. It's really, really been fast to set up and quite accurate for making little cuts like this, which if you're building a locomotive, you need to do a lot of little radius cutting operations just like this. Speed gains on setup here are a big win. Now to sharpen up the inside where the two features meet, that little corner between the teardrop and the taper, I went over to the die filer, got a triangular file on there, and this was just the ticket for roughing in the final shape. So I'm getting rid of the excess material left by the rotary table, and then I've roughed in the teardrop shape. It's not perfect, it needs some more work yet, but I've roughed it in on the die filer, and then I can finish it up by hand with some needle files. All of the running gear, like these main rods, are very charismatic and important pieces of the locomotive. It's the main thing that people are going to be looking at the most, so you really want to take your time and finish these as nicely as possible. So I spent quite a bit of time with needle files, both correcting the shape of the teardrop and making that interface nice, then I also did a lot of draw filing to remove tool marks from the milling cutters. Then I also did a lot of sanding to improve the finish and luster. I started with 320 grit. I brought every surface on the rod down to 320 grit, and then I went to 600 and then 800. I'm not aiming for a mirror finish with these. That would be silly. This is a locomotive. It's not jewelry. But I'm aiming for kind of a metal grain satin kind of finish. So no tool marks, no weird discontinuities where cutters started and stopped, that kind of thing. But a smooth finish with no visible marks or scratches of any kind, but not a mirror polish, if that makes sense. Hopefully you get the sense here on camera of what the finish I'm going for looks like. A perfectly smooth finish is also corrosion protection, because the smoother a finish is, the longer it will take to rust. And these are mild steel parts at the end of the day, so they could corrode. Now, let's be honest, this is a locomotive. All of this stuff and a five foot radius around it is going to be covered in oil pretty quickly, but for now, we'll do our best to keep things nice. Now, there's little tiny holes drilled and tapped at the ends of the main rods. On the prototype, these are for something called the cotter bolt, which is, I believe, part of the system for fixturing and adjusting the bearing wear on the main rod bearings. However, on the model, they're just decorative, so we're making a little decorative piece to go in the end that looks like the cotter bolt on the real thing. The cotter bolt has a hexagonal feature, so I busted out the black book, which has a great chart in it for giving you the diameter of round bar that you need to start with if you want to get a given hex profile across the flats. That's a really nice little chart, one of my favorites. I didn't have hex bar stock in the tiny size that this part needs. I always try to start with hex bar if you can, because it saves you a lot of time. But I didn't have it, and I didn't need very much. I only needed two tiny little pieces, so rather than wait to order the right bar stock, I decided to just make it here on the milling machine with a collar block. These little collet bolt features are stainless, so they won't corrode. I decided to push my luck and see if I could make pieces this small out of stainless. It was a bit of an adventure, but I think it went okay, as you'll see. Once I had my tiny little piece of bespoke hex bar stock, 
then it was over to the lathe to cut the features. So the hex profile is in the middle of the part. At the end of the part, there's a tiny little thread. That's a 256 thread, very, very small. I'll start with that by facing off the end, of course, as is tradition. And then I turn down a small diameter to the major diameter of a 256 thread, minus a little bit for die clearance. These pieces are very fiddly, but we only need two of them, so it didn't really take that long. Although, for the record, I actually made three of them, because when I attempted to install the first one that I made in the main rod, I twisted it off. The threads were a little gummed up, it got stuck, I pushed a little too hard, and these pieces are so tiny that it just twisted the end of the thread right off. Which was a good day, because then I got to spend some time drilling out the main rod and recutting the threads and repairing everything. And then made two more and was a lot more careful the second time installing them. These pieces are very, very small. Possibly the smallest ones on the entire locomotive, I'm not sure. Even in stainless, parts this small are pretty fragile. How small are they? Well, here is a Canadian quarter for scale. Oh, sorry, uh, I guess for the American viewers, a Canadian quarter is 89% the size of a Sacagawea dollar coin. Happy to have cleared that up for you. Off camera, I also made all of the bearings for these rods. There's some kind of T-shaped bearings that go in the bores, and then there's a thrust bearing that goes between the main rods and the side rods. I made all those off camera because they're very, very simple bronze bearings. You've seen me make a million of these. And there's some little ones that go in the small end, of course, as well. Well, there we go. Those are the completed main rods. I'm very pleased with them. They're not perfect, but I'm very happy with how they came out anyway. Now let's get these installed on the locomotive and see if they chooch. So the thrust bearing goes between the two rods, then the main rod goes in there. There's also a thrust surface on the back of the main rod bearings that runs on the thrust bearings. And there you have it. So that little end is going to someday go in the crosshead that is driven by the piston rod, and it'll chooch thusly. These were quite a bit easier to make than the side rods, both because they're a simpler geometry and also because I learned a lot about making this type of part when I did the side rods. I'm really pleased with how they came out. I hope you enjoyed watching the process of them being made, and, well, maybe this will inspire you to do a little bit of locomotive work of your own. Thank you very much for watching, and thanks to my patrons for making all of this content possible. We're going to get into the valve gear proper here very, very soon, so stay tuned for that. It's going to get exciting, and I will see you next time.